Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm Ron Kagan, director of the Zoological Society. Welcome. We're very happy to have you here. Um, I can't remember the name of the movie that Tom Hanks is in about the Women's Baseball League. What was that called? League of Their Own, right. Great movie. So there's no crying in baseball. There's no crying in the zoo. But tonight, you might actually cry. Now, don't worry. Don't worry. It'll be tears of joy, mostly. Um, but you're going to hear a story tonight that is unbelievably compelling. Um, I think everybody here knows that our, our mission for the Zoological Society is celebrating and saving wildlife. And sometimes we take that saving part, well, we take the celebrating part literally too, but we take the saving part very literally. Uh, just a couple of years ago, in fact, uh, we had been involved in so many rescues that um, a special rescue fund was established called the Calter Lazat Rescue Fund uh, to help us continue to do that work. Now, that's work that we mostly do in the United States and sometimes it's thousands of animals and sometimes it's an individual. Um, but tonight you're gonna hear about rescue work in Africa that is truly extraordinary. Um, and one of the nice things is that when we talk about conservation and what's going on in wild places, very often what you hear is a lot of doom and gloom. Um, there are a lot of hardships, but this is a story that has incredible promise and already has led to some very remarkable uh, accomplishments. So, as I said, you might cry a little, but I think most of this is gonna be tears of joy. Uh, I do wanna give credit uh, where credit is due. This project is a relatively new initiative and like most uh, good conservation initiatives, it is a collaboration. Uh, which was really started by, well, I, I, I think uh, Lao Tzu and, and Sonia will tell you, but was started by the Fosse Fund with help from uh, Disney's uh, Wildlife Conservation Fund and uh, several others, uh, a group called Gorilla Docs and a couple of other zoological societies, Houston and Dallas, uh, my alma mater, Dallas Zoo. Uh, so this is a, a wonderful story of important organizations working together. Uh, and like everything else, the people that are involved in this view this not just as doing good deeds, but as making an investment. Uh, an investment in our future and in the future of nature, and of, of course those are inextricably uh, combined. So. Um, let me introduce uh, Lao Tzu and Sonia and then turn it over to them. Um, and I'll introduce uh, Lao Tzu first, but Sonia will come up and talk first. And at the end, uh, I will host, moderate, whatever, uh, some questions and answers. So there will be time for that. Uh, Lao Tzu Sandman was born in the Netherlands and spent his childhood in the UK and Switzerland and Belgium. As a child, his grandmother took him frequently to Africa, and not surprisingly, he became inspired by Jane Goodall, ultimately managing Africa programs for the Jane Goodall Institute in the Netherlands while he attended vet school. He later became vice president for Africa programs for JGI, which is Jane Goodall Institute in Europe. Since 2010, Lautzen has lived in the mountains of the part of the Democratic Republic of Congo where Grace is, and he directs the Congolese operations. He has a particular interest in community conservation, and he strives to empower the Congolese nationals to make a positive change for humans and wildlife. Sonia uh, Kallenberg is a primate behavioral biologist and her mom is here tonight. Hi, mom. Uh, Sonia has a PhD from Harvard. She spent 11 years studying wild chimpanzee social behavior. She also completed her postdoc at Harvard and for five years taught anthropology and biology at Bates College in Maine. She began her work with great apes as a high school volunteer at a certain zoo south of here in Ohio. 
We have a friendly rivalry with the Toledo Zoo, as many know. She's been a passionate advocate for great ape conservation since 1997, when as a caregiver at a sanctuary in Borneo, she witnessed the escalating illegal trade in pet orangutans. For over a decade, Sonia has worked with nonprofit organizations focused on great ape conservation in Africa, Indonesia, and on the international stage. And before becoming the executive director of GRACE a couple of years ago, she directed anti-poaching patrols and conservation education programs in and around Kibali National Park in Uganda. So, with that, let me introduce to you Sonia. Let's give them a round of applause. Thank you, Ryan. Do you want to come out here? He's hiding back here. This is last year. I'll come and sit here. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Ron, for that really great introduction. And um, it's really a pleasure to be here. Um, we feel honored to um, be here at the Detroit Zoo, who is um, one of our newest partners on, on the GRACE project. Um, so thank you to Ron and to Scott and the whole team for inviting us here tonight. Um, when we met with Ron earlier today, he gave us a challenge. <clears throat> Many of you have attended, um, I'm sure, Jane Goodall's talks, and you know that she begins every one of her talks with a chimpanzee greeting. And so he said, well, of course, you and Nelson should do a gorilla greeting. Well, gorilla, greeting, or gorilla vocalizations are a bit harder to make than chimp vocalizations, but um, we'll give it our best shot. So we want to say hi to all of you from the gorillas at Grace. <laughs> so let's hear your best gorilla. Ready? One, two, three. <laughs> Pretty good. All right. <laughs> so um, as Ron said tonight, we're going to mainly be talking about hope. Um, I drew the, the short straw, and I'm going to start the presentation talking about um, some of the threats that, gr that Grower's Grills are facing, and Loudson gets the job of talking about the hope part. So, um, but that's okay. I forgive him for that. All right, so our story starts here in the heart of Central Africa in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Um, or also called DRC. Uh, DRC is Africa's third largest country and is home to 68 million people. And it's one of the um, most biodiverse places on Earth. It's home to the second largest rainforest in the world and, of course, some of the world's most magnificent wildlife. So many different um, endangered species call the DRC home, including um, forest elephant, okapi, and three of the African great apes. So in DRC, there are chimpanzees, bonobos, also called pygmy chimpanzees, and um, two different kinds of gorillas. There are two subspecies, well, there's four subspecies gorillas in total, but two of them live in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Um, the subspecies of gorilla called mountain gorilla is probably the one that most of you have heard of before. And this, of course, was made famous by um, the pioneering primatologist uh, Diane Fossey. And Fossey's work um, really opened up the world's view of of gorillas, and rather than the fierce um, King Kong stereotype that um, was, was prevalent early on, um, her work and the work of many scientists that followed um, Fossey really showed that gorillas are n not these fierce, um, yes, they do you know, um, act fierce sometimes, but they're, they're really gentle um, vegetarians, and they have very close family um, ties and bonds. And um, I, think, I think gorillas really connect with people um, more than many other animals. And I think many of you have probably experienced some of this. So how many of you have gone to a zoo and went and spent some time watching gorillas? Not just watching them, but really watching them. Yep, a lot of hands. 
So there's something really, really amazing about gorillas. And I, we were just before um, we came out here tonight, we were, we were talking, what is it about gorillas that are so amazing? Um, I think, of course, you know, they are closely related to humans, and that's something that we can all identify with. When you watch mothers and babies interacting, you can see some of these human-like characteristics. Um, you know, they're, of course, the largest primate, and so they're very impressive. Um, but it's, it's something that's harder, harder to put your finger on, I think. I think it's when you are watching gorillas, not just watching them, but like I said, really watching them and looking into their eyes. There's something there that's looking back at you. And that's something that I think all of us in this room and many people really connect with. Um, gorillas are special and gorillas are loved. Um, and they're also in trouble. So in DRC, like I said, there are two subspecies of gorillas. The mountain gorillas are the ones that everyone hears about. And mountain gorillas have been studied continuously for 50 years. That is one of the most intensely studied animals on record. Um, so we know a lot about mountain gorillas. Um, may, may, maybe many of you in the room have never even heard of Grower's gorillas. Raise your hand if you've never heard of Grower's gorillas until tonight. Yeah, so um, Grower's gorillas are a lesser known um, subspecies of gorilla. They are the largest of the four gorilla subspecies. So the males can get up to 500 pounds. So this is the largest, the greatest of the great apes is the Grower's gorilla. Um, and the reason why they're lesser known is it's been very difficult to go in and study them with the intensity that the mountain gorillas have been studied. Um, and this is partly because of where they live. So mountain gorillas live in three different countries. They live in Rwanda, Uganda, and the Democratic Republic of Congo. Grower's gorillas only live in the Democratic Republic of Congo and only in the eastern provinces of the DRC. And maybe many of you know from um, keeping up with the world news that this is some of the, that the eastern part of DRC is one of the most troubled regions in Africa. Um, so beginning um, during the Rwandan genocide, which happened in uh, 1994, um, so Rwanda borders uh, DRC um, to the east, and during the genocide, about one million people spilled over and settled into the eastern part of the DRC. And DRC at the time was already um, unstable in terms of um, uh, the government that was there, and this influx of a million people into the eastern part of that country really um, destabilized an already unstable situation um, and plunged that country into its own civil war. And so since 1998, violent conflict and things associated with that violent, com violent conflict like um, disease and poverty have killed five million people. Five million people. That's more than any conflict since World War II. And most people have no idea that this is going on. So this is something that's not been covered widely in the press. Um, but five million people have died since 1998 in this part of the country, in this part of the world. And the, um, a peace accord was signed in 2003. So the conflict officially ended then, but fighting has continued in the eastern part of DRC ever since. It hasn't stopped. Um, and the toll that this fighting has taken on the civilian population in this, part of the, in this part of the country cannot be overstated. Tens of thousands of children have been forced to become soldiers or um, it, it, join rebel groups. And in some areas of eastern Congo, two out of every three women have suffered rape and some form of sexual violence at the hands of rebel or government soldiers. Nearly every family that you meet in this region has lost immediate family members. And today, millions of people are denied the chance to earn a living or provide for their families due, the, due to the continuing instability and poverty going on. So an influx of one million people into Eastern DRC. Now remember, Eastern DRC is the only place in the world that Grower's Grills live, only in that Eastern part of DRC. So a million people flood over the border or are displaced internally during this conflict. 
And where do they settle? In Grower's Gorilla Habitat. So this is a, a photo um, taken from National Geographic, which shows um, refugee and, and internally displaced um, camps. And in the background, you see a mountain. That's Virunga National Park. This is Africa's first national park and home to not only mountain gorillas, but also Grower's gorillas. They have both subspecies of gorillas living in that area. And at the height of um, the instability and in, in, in violence in this area, there um, were up to 10 different camps like this um, immediately surrounding the park. So people were not only around the park, but also living inside national parks and protected areas. And a million people, what do a million people need? An influx of a million people means an a, a increased demand for natural resources. People need to heat their water, to, make, uh, to boil their water, to cook. Um, they need fuel, wood, they need charcoal. And that was taken out of Grower's Gorilla Habitat. So this again is Virunga National Park here and women collecting um, fuel wood um, from the park. So across the countries that make up the Congo Basin, so there's six countries that make up the Congo Basin, which is um, the second largest rainforest in the world. Um, this, this is showing um, rates of annual degradation of the forest habitat. And you can see DRC in the middle here. So of all of these countries in the Congo Basin, the DRC has the highest rate of accelerating um, deforestation of, of any other country. And these, this data is actually a little old, but it's continuing. So many of you have maybe heard in the news about um, uh, the threat of um, oil drilling inside Virunga National Park from a, a British company called SoCo. Um, so that's been happening. So the, the Congolese government um, sold licenses for SoCo to drill inside uh, Virunga National Park. That has been halted, um, which was very good news. But that's just one of the threats. So there was a paper published recently um, estimating that what we're seeing with orangutans in terms of um, oil palm, the threat of oil palm um, that's cut down orangutan habitat across Southeast Asia, that's coming to Central Africa very soon. So, you know, you get one success here, then down the line you have uh, more things coming in terms of the, the Grower's Gorilla habitat. And um, in between 1998 and 2000, there was an increase in the price of coltan. So coltan is um, columbium and tantalum, which is used in electronics like cell phones. So all of you who have a cell phone um, have coltan uh, in it. And when the cell phone boom happened in the late um, 1990s, early 2000s, um, thousands invaded protected areas like Cahuzzi Biega Na National Park, um, which is a UNESCO World Heritage Site and also um, uh, home to the, one of the largest populations of Grower's gorillas. So people invaded the park um, in order to start mining coltan there in order to fuel um, our need for cell phones. And um, in addition to, to mining this mineral, they needed ways to feed the miners and their families who moved into the park. And how they did that was um, they hired professional hunters to kill gorillas. So Cahuzzi Biega National Park, um, like I said, is a stronghold for Grower's gorillas and also was highly developed um, in the 1990s for tourism. And during the height of the coltan boom, um, about 50% of the gorilla population in Cahuzzi Biega National Park was wiped out. And I think the, the saddest figure is that 88% of the population of gorillas that was habituated for tourists to go see, so these were gorillas who were used to humans because the tourists would go out and follow them, 88% of those gorillas were wiped out because they were, ta they were um, tamed to humans and so they were easy targets. Um, and so huge numbers of gorillas dying um, during this period of time. And it's not just the habitat destruction um, that's, that's a threat to grower's gorillas, and it's not just the hunting for bush meat. But also, like I said, everyone loves gorillas. And gorillas are often used um, to make political statements. So for example, in Virunga National Park, um, several mountain gorillas um, during this, this peak period of, um, of um, instability in the early 2000s, several mountain gorillas were deliberately killed in order to make a statement. So in Virunga National Park, um, there was a rebel group that was doing illegal um, charcoal production. 
in order to sell to people living around um, that area. And the conservationists were trying to um, prevent this charcoal production from happening. And the people doing the charcoal got mad, and so they said, okay, we'll just kill the gorillas. And that's what they did. So all of these threats have really taken their toll on the Grower's gorillas. Um, we actually don't have good estimates for how many Grower's gorillas remain in the world. Um, the last complete census that um, estimated there were 17,000 um, in the 1960s. And the estimates are currently um, show that from since the 1990s, around 50% of Grower's gorilla habitat has been cut down or con converted into um, agriculture. And the overall population of Grower's gorillas is thought to have declined by about 75% since that time. So the estimates now are, are, are wide ranging and that's just because it's been very difficult because of the violence um, ongoing in this area to get in and do good surveys on the ground. But the range is between two to 10,000 Grower's gorillas left in the world. Um, we were just recently talking to the scientists who are doing the surveys now and they said that the numbers are coming back much closer to 2,000 than to 10,000. So Grower's gorillas are, are definitely in trouble here. Um, they're currently listed as endangered on the IUCN red list. Um, the only reason they're not critically endangered is because we don't have the data yet to show this massive um, population decline that has been taking place. But um, the plans are in the next uh, year or so, we'll start to have the data and um, the red list people have already talked about um, upgrading their status, but it's really kind of a downgrading their status to critically endangered. Um, since 2010, the Grower's gorillas have been recognized as um, the one of the 25 most endangered primates in the world by Conservation International. So that list comes out every other year, and the, la the last three consecutive lists, um, Grower's gorillas have been included on that. So a symptom of the worsening situation for Grower's, for Grower's gorillas is the increasing number of orphan gorillas inside the DRC. So when uh, people hunt gorillas for meat. Um, typically what happens is they will hunt the adult gorillas, which contain a lot of meat. They're big animals. Um, but the infants, you know, don't have a lot of meat on them and instead are sold um, alive uh, as pets. So typically this is when they um, are discovered by, um, by law enforcement. And since 2003, 20 Grower's Gorilla infants have been confiscated by law enforcement in the DRC, typically while they're being um, sold as pets. So 20, that number seems pretty small, but that just only hints at the level of devastation. Um, so it's estimated for every gorilla that survives to be confiscated, uh, three or four more have died. And for every gorilla um, infant that is captured, you have to remember its whole family has been slaughtered. So on average, 10 individuals then die for every one um, that is captured. And gorilla uh, infants are much more fragile than other great apes. So for example, uh, chimpanzee infants that are confiscated um, as orphans are, are relatively hardy. They, they survive in some of the most awful deplorable conditions you can imagine being chained to bumpers of cars or um, even worse. Um, but gorillas are basically tend to die. They give up. Um, and they're very fragile and um, they just stop eating without, without their mothers. They just stop eating and give up. Um, so most gorillas do not survive to even um, get to the point where they can be confiscated. So I wanted to bring the, the, the situation that an orphan gorilla faces home to you by telling you the story about Imani. So um, Imani is a female gorilla that we met um, when she was confiscated, confiscated in a sting operation. And I wanted to show you a quick video to give you a sense of how the gorillas um, come to us when they, when they come to Greece. Vous serez unis de vos armes. En aucun cas est-ce qu'il faut se servir de l'arme. 
Kuna wakati yenyewe mtatumikisha zile silaha. Sauf en cas où votre vie est menacée. Um, right, for the last uh, three months, um, we've been uh, in communication with people in Wali Kali, which is a town not far from Goma. And um, the people have a whole network of um, wildlife trade, and they've been trading in uh, baby gorillas, um, baby chimpanzees, okapi skins, endangered species, and uh, ivory. Il faut être très vigilant. En principe, la personne ne sera pas armée. Mais il faut être très vigilant, très calme pour l'opération. We are at uh, Goma Airport. Um, for the last uh, three months, we've been running an undercover operation on a uh, trafficking ring in endangered species. I've been posing as a wildlife trader, and today one of them has just taken a plane from a town called Wali Kali, west from here, and. Um, is bringing me a baby gorilla. Um, right now we have rangers on standby um, and we will making, be making arrests. Il bouge. Ok, il est en vie, mais c'est chaud. Ok, tu vas avec Eddie, ok, ok. Dans ton car. So that's Imani. Um, when she was found at the bottom of that plastic bag, um, she had a, a bullet lodged in her right leg, um, a result of the poaching event that separated her from her family. Um, so that gives you a sense of the starting point of, of Grace. And like I said, I got through the short end of the, uh, the short straw and had to talk about the, uh, the, the non-hopeful part, but now we'll move on to the hopeful part. But um, so that's Imani's start, but to see Imani today, um, I should have put a picture in here. Um, she's doing amazing. She's living as, as a normal gorilla now. Um, so Lao Tzu will, will, will bring that part of the story around there. Well, thank you very much, Sonia. And thank you, every individual who is here who took the effort to come and listen to our stories. I traveled from the Congo to be here today, and um, I want to thank you for having me and for um, giving me that opportunity to talk about these beautiful gorillas and the community that um, I work with. And I consider myself to be a privileged person to have um, a job where I can do something that I really care about and um, I want to show you um, what I deal with every day and share some of the stories that um, I get to see. So in 2008, we needed to find a solution for the problem of the confiscated Grower's gorillas. We f were sure that um, we couldn't stop the wildlife trade immediately, and we needed to focus on a sustainable solution for these confiscated gorillas. On the other hand, if you want to do law enforcement and want to confiscate wildlife, you need to have a responsible um, future uh, or solution for these orphaned gorillas. Because you can do law enforcement and confiscate them, but if you don't have the facilities to provide and to set an example um, of animal care and animal welfare, law enforcement doesn't make any sense. So that's when um, <clears throat> we started talking with the local communities. And um, Ron talked about collaborations um, when he introduced us. And I want to add one thing to our collaboration. That is 
the local communities of the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Because even though gorillas and humans are all survivors of a horrible war, they want to invest in the future and they want to survive. So um, that is what I want to talk about. This is what I see in the mornings when I wake up. This is my view and I hear the gorillas on the background. It's one of the most beautiful areas that I've ever seen in the world. And these are the people I work with every day. They are the most powerful, um, positive people you can ever imagine. They have lost their family members. Many women have children and they don't even know the father. They are the victims of sexual violence and they work really hard to give these children a future. So what you see here is Mwami Stuka placing the first stone for grace. Mwami Stuka is um, the local king. He's the regional king of the Nandi tribe. The Nandis are um, a very large tribe in eastern DRC. And Mwami Stuka was convinced that investing in um, wildlife conservation was a very important thing to do. The, Kong the Nandi people consider gorillas as um, totem animals for their tribe. They're proud to have gorillas. Um, and today we had a meeting and I was talking about um, conservation in the DRC and I compared it to the work I've done in Uganda. In Uganda, we worked almost 10 years to establish wildlife corridors. And then when I moved to the Congo, I found that the community had already created enormous community reserves. And Sonia was just talking about the national parks. Well, I'm very happy that I get the chance to work with community reserves because the community has taken this initiative. They want to protect their ancestors' land and the wildlife that lives there. Um, they don't need arms. They are the guards of their reserve. And um, they want to provide a future for, this, uh, for the gorillas. So Mwami Stuka is considered to be a very important person. The Nandi tribe can think he is more important than the president of the DRC. And he placed the first stone for us at Grace. We had two groups of gorillas that had to be moved to Grace. One group came from Rwanda. We had to bring um, six gorillas to Rwanda um, because uh, during the insecurity in the DRC, um, we thought we couldn't handle um, these gorillas in Congo. But while this group was already in Rwanda, we confiscated more gorillas and four more were waiting for us in uh, Goma. So the first group of four gorillas came from Goma, then the second group of six came from Rwanda, and here you see an example of how we had to transfer these gorillas. This um, gorilla came from Rwanda, so she had to be crated there, um, driven across the border to the airport in Goma, taken from her crate, put in the helicopter, and then when the helicopter um, arrived at Grace, we had to anesthetize her again to carry her in the facility. Um, a very big operation, um, but it was absolutely worth it. <clears throat> so, here you get to see the faces of the gorillas that are currently at Grace. Um, it's not complete, but you'll get to see more photos. This is Muisa. She was actually named Ihirwe. Um, Ihirwe was confiscated in September 2011 and taken across the border into Rwanda, where she had to stay for about three years. Um, in 2012, we had another outbreak of insecurity in Goma, a rebel group called M23, um, caused a lot of problems, 
and we were not able to transfer Ihirwe back to the DRC to take her to Grace. So here you see how an average gorilla arrives. Usually they're completely dehydrated. Um, gorillas stop eating. The first thing we do, apart from a medical check, is find a caregiver who will spend 24 hours a day with that individual. Gorilla, uh, gorillas need to bond with an individual and they need to be together all the time. We humans, we actually um, have a very easy life. We can put our babies in a little bed and do other stuff. With gorillas, no way. So after three years um, of waiting, we found the right moment and the United Nations offered um, to help us with their helicopter. And um, this is in uh, April this year. Muisa arrived and she was flown from Goma. She was driv uh, driven across the border uh, into Goma and from there she was flown with the helicopter to um, the village of Kasuo where we live. <clears throat> and when I talk with gorilla caregivers or people who work with gorillas in zoos. Um, we all, they always, they can, everyone who works with gorillas can tell you about the difficulties of integrating new individuals into an existing group. It is often very tricky and it's a process that can take a lot of time. Well, our experiences are very, very different. We are very lucky that we have a relatively young group and so far we have been able to integrate every newcomer into this group. And our goal is to um, give these gorillas a future, um, to be real gorillas. And um, the females immediately take the role of a um, foster mother. So they care about the babies, they carry them on their back, they will nurse them, they will comfort them, and that's the way it's supposed to be. So, I just showed you this photo of Muisa when she was just confiscated. So, um, and this is, this photo is taken one minute after she was integrated in her group. When Muisa was moved to the DRC and she came to Grace, the population, the community, decided to call her Muisa and not Ihirwe. They thought she needed a Congolese name and not a Rwandan name, so they named her Muisa, and Muisa means hope. Can you imagine three years without seeing another gorilla, and this is the first thing that happens? We were all in tears. Here you see the largest guy, Entabobwa, which means fearless, and he is playing. Here you see the entire group of gorillas. And although we provide enrichment, they don't care much about it. Their main enrichment is social interaction. We feed our gorillas a completely natural diet. We have a great team of caregivers. They collect about 600 pounds of vegetation every day. They, they, we collect 45 different species from the forest, which we have observed by um, when we were working with the gorillas in the forest. We saw what species of vegetations they eat. We made a list and we collect 45 different species, and um, every day they get 600 pounds. So, we are now working on the next phase of grace, and um, this is hopefully, probably the largest gorilla enclosure in the entire world. Um, a new 24-acre forest enclosure. 
We've been working on this for the past two and a half years. Um, hundred community members have been working on the construction. We had to bring all the supplies from abroad, carry them over very, very bad roads um, in trucks that are very old, um, but we made it happen. So in two weeks, we will release the gorillas in this enormous um, forest, and this is going to be one of the first steps for them to move um, closer to being in the wild. And I just told you that the community is one of our biggest collaborators. Well, all this forest that you see here, all this land, has been donated by the local communities. So, since the first gorillas arrived in 2010, we have invested a lot in capacity building um, Congolese nationals. I'm the only uh, foreigner that lives in the DRC. Um, we work with a group of 22 staff members. They all come from the area, and most of them had very little education, but the great thing is they want to learn, they want to improve. This for, is for them a chance of a lifetime, and people are doing whatever they can to do a good job. And um, I have the best team in the world to work with. Even if we have um, people from North American zoos who come to advise us and to give workshops for our caregivers and our maintenance teams, people are always surprised if, about how good our staff are. So, GRACE stands for Guerrilla Rehabilitation and Conservation Education. Investing in the new generations of Congolese is one of our main goals, and um, the Congolese community members are extremely proud of the fact that gorillas have returned to their homeland and um, that they get a chance to live with these gorillas. So, we do education on law enforcement, we do education on sustainable livelihoods, um, we educate people on um, animal welfare. Here you see a poster about where we talk about um, law enforcement, that it is illegal to capture, sell, uh, or buy chimpanzees and gorillas. When we talk about bushmeat hunting, we don't talk about people who are starving. We are talking about um, luxury meat, um, and this is mainly for people who are um, rebels, so that local community members do not hunt great apes. But on the other hand, there is a big need for animal protein, and that is why we work with the um, women's groups, in the area and we help them to raise chickens and rabbits and guinea pigs and pigs so that they have a source of animal protein to feed their children and they can even sell the meat so they can make a little income and send their children to school. This is a sign in front of Muisa Primary School. I talked about Muisa, but Muisa, mean, Muisa means hope. It's the name of one of our gorillas, but it's also the name of the primary school. And um, I love the words, ready, ready, ready for conservation. And um, the next slide will be um, a short video where you can see these beautiful faces of the school children, and they're singing a song about gorillas, and they're actually naming the individual names of each gorilla. And today I was talking with the animal welfare team um, here at Detroit Zoo, and um, we were talking about the importance of t telling the stories of the individual animals, 
because that is what is um, really um, um, sticks to people. That is what gives people the compassion for the animals. So I hope this starts in the right way. <laughs> So here you see a group of community members who recently came to Grace to pray. We had um, a situation where the Chinese government wanted to buy eastern lowland gorillas because they're such a special species. They're the largest primates in the world. They cannot be found in zoos. The only zoo in the world that has two individuals is the Antwerp Zoo in Belgium. Um, but they were actually rescue animals. They were taken to Europe um, during the war. There were two confiscated gorillas. And then there was this rumor of Asian zoos looking for this rare and exclusive animal. And when the community heard about this, they said no. I am um, a foreigner in the DRC. I am a visitor. Um, I'm hosted by the Congolese government. I cannot say no. I can say I do not agree, but I have no authority to stop this. There, you see the importance of the community. The community decided that these gorillas have to live on the land they were born. And they came to grace, they came to pray, they sent messages on the local radios, they went to the media, they sent letters to the government, and we've never heard again about Chinese being interested. This is the power of working with a community that has taken this initiative, and they have asked us to come and help them. We are not foreigners who have come to Congo to say we want to save this species. No, we have been invited by the Congolese communities to help them um, realize what they want. And that is why I'm so happy and I feel so privileged to work on this project because I've rarely, I've, I don't very often see projects where it is the community who is actually uh, initiating these kinds of hopeful in, uh, things. So this is the final video, um, which I would like to show you. and said we could build the facility here for 15 gorillas. It's just now finished and we have 13. So it's not a center to keep growers gorillas in captivity. It's aimed to release them and increase the population. They are more likely to call Grace, Dying Fossil Gorilla Fund or ICCN so we can move fast and confiscate the baby. We're working with the local communities to create spaces within their tribal areas for gorilla conservation. And we're also fighting against bushmeat, which is one major source of the grouse gorilla decline. Ihomi was confiscated four days after he was taken from the wild. 
the gorilla who arrived before Homei that was Mobutu, and he was kept in captivity for quite a while. In the end, they can only be saved by the Congolese, and we just guide them and provide support they need to really rehabilitate these animals and put them back in the wild. They have a treasure that is found nowhere else in the world. If uh, I can see them one day having babies, living long, that's my wish, my hope for, for them. Yeah. Well, this is the end of the many things um, I wanted to share with you. And um, finally, you, will, you see all the partners who we're working with. Um, we should thank the gorillas too, because without um, being able to tell their stories and without the opportunity to be part of their lives, and um, I couldn't be here and share all of this with you. Um, also, I'd like to thank the community of the Taina Nature Reserve and all of you who is here and who have come to listen to this story of hope, or at least um, I hope it has given you a little bit of hope. Thank you. Why don't you have a seat? Okay, so I told you you'd cry. Did you cry? Um, thank you both. Uh, that was a terrific story. And of course, this is a story that is not finished. And I think our, our goal, the Zoological Society's goal, is to make sure that this story ends the right way. Um, I think this has the potential of being a very unique model. And this is why, uh, during the introduction, I, I told you that we were so incredibly excited about it. We're involved in so many conservation initiatives, but this one is different, especially because of what Lautzen was talking about, the fact that the community, a community that has experienced five million people being killed around it and untold millions suffering in other ways, actually surrounding the orphanage to protect the gorillas. After everything they've been through, that was as important to them as their own families. That's amazing. So for us, this is great hope because they also, Grace is, I shouldn't say they, since we are now officially a part of Grace and, and a part of the leadership of Grace. The fact that Grace embraces not just conservation, but also animal welfare and humane education and those things, we're not going to do a lecture about this tonight, but those things sometimes, at least historically, have been viewed as conflicting. We don't view it that way. We very much view these animals as being individuals, just like everybody in this room is an individual. And sometimes when we talk about animals, we talk about, well, this is what gorillas are like, or this is what orangutans are like. Can you imagine how silly that sounds if an orangutan said, well, this is what people are like? We're all different. So there is a very powerful story here, an absolute commitment that we're not taking gorillas out of the wild. The whole idea is to actually reintroduce them not just into that huge multi-acre facility, but ultimately back into the wild if it's deemed safe. And that will be determined by the community, whether they can make sure that it's safe enough. So it's pretty cool. Now, this does require a lot of resources, although frankly, the resources to get stuff done there, even with all the hardships of moving things, trucks and transport, it's a lot cheaper than it is doing it here. So the Zoological Society is a significant investor now. I personally am investing uh, in uh, half of a, an annual salary for an educator. I'm really hoping that a lot of you will be motivated and everything that's raised tonight goes directly to Grace. It doesn't come to DZS. 
It doesn't replenish DZS's financial commitment in any way to Grace. I'm hoping that all of you will see there is incredible hope here, and we can't be complacent. We absolutely have to do this. Uh, there really could be as few as 2,000 of these gorillas left on the planet. So in one hour on a Saturday, we'll have more people come into the zoo than there are growers, gorillas left on the planet. We've got to save them. Now, um, I want to have some time for Q&A. Uh, we have a couple of people with mics, so if you raise your hand, uh, somebody will come to you. But the first thing I, I just want to ask, the first question, uh, for, for me as a kid, reading um, Born Free, uh, Joy Addison's books, and a little bit of Shackleton, a little bit of Jane Goodall, uh, had a profound effect on me getting me started. Sonia, what, um, what ignited you and when? Hmm. Well, my mom's in the audience. Maybe <laughs> she can speak to that. Um, well, I wanted to maybe mention how what br brought me to Grace because that I think um, is, yeah. So when I learned about Grace, it was about midnight on a Friday. I specifically remember this. And I couldn't sleep, and I was just on the internet. And at the time, I was teaching at Bates College in Maine. And I loved my job there. I had a, a, a nice job in the um, bio biology and anthropology departments. And um, but there was something. I, I learned about Grace, and then I started reading a little bit more about it. And I found out about this community piece of it. And I had been working for a decade in great ape conservation. Um, I had never heard of anything like this with a community so committed that at a time when they're coming out of war and all of the atrocities that they had experienced, they set aside 220,000 acres of their ancestral land for conservation, the, the DRC's first ever community-managed reserve. And for me, that was just wow. And thinking about the most adverse environment for conservation you can imagine and here's Grace actually making progress and doing it in that environment because of that community. I was, I was really excited about it, and I, the application for this job was due the next day. <laughs> so I stayed up all night, and I did it. And I feel, like Lawson said, very privileged to be working with this project. And um, yeah, just really amazing. Well, and I can tell you that uh we, we have a, there's a board of, uh, I think, nine of ten of us, and all of us are in awe of Sonia and Lautzen. Lautzen, how about you? Uh, and you can answer one or both of those questions. What first ignited your interest in animals? I'm guessing your grandmother taking you to Africa had something to do with it, and also specifically Grace. Okay, thank you. Well, yes, indeed. It was my grandmother who took me to Africa, but way before that, I was... I cannot answer this question because I was born as someone who liked animals. I cannot remember the moment when I decided to do something with animals. But my grandmother definitely encouraged me. She wanted to show me the world before it got spoiled. And she wanted me to experience the world before I got spoiled. <laughs> so she took me to Africa. For three months, we went camping in Malawi. She settled us in an African village. She sent me to school with the African children. She made me sleep in an African mud house because she wanted me to not be there as a tourist. So I fell in love with Africa. Then Grace, why Grace? Well, if I would keep it very short, I would say if, I, if something happens to me, and I pass away, I know this community is, continue, is going to continue what I started. And um, I'm very happy to have this um, opportunity to empower these people, people who didn't have the opportunities I had in my life. Um, but I can give something back to them, and they will continue it, and they will reinvest all the knowledge and everything they've learned from working together with all of us, um, and it will make a significant change in their life. 
So um, that's why grace is so important to me. Okay, um, so happy to, uh, they are happy to uh, do a Q&A for a few minutes and there still is both some of their awesome merchandise out there. If you saw the t-shirts, they're Grower Power, that's so cool. Um, and also there are envelopes there and there is website information so that if you want to invest as many of us do, uh, you can do that. So can you, uh, hang on one sec. She's going to hold the mic for you. Thank you. Um, oh. You yes, mentioned that the goal is to reintroduce uh, gorillas back into the natural environment. You made me think of a question that maybe all of you could ask. At one time, you had elephants in the Detroit Zoo. You decided to eliminate elephants because you thought that was probably cruel and what have you. I came to this, and when I come to the zoo, I'm most interested in gorillas. And what you said, I agree with. I would hate to think that you would de, you know, would eliminate the gorilla exhibit in the zoo in order to give them a more humane treatment. But I have to ask you the question. Yeah, what is the place for gorillas in zoos, and can zoos not be used as a place to allow more gorillas to be uh, reproduced? I don't know if that's an appropriate yeah. term to use, but it seems to me that there's a shortage of gorillas based upon what you said, 2,000. I guess the lowland gorillas, there's probably, I've heard several hundred thousand, I don't know, but I don't even know how many gorillas there are in the world, but it seems like the zoos could be used as a way to propagate the species rather than to eliminate them from the zoos. But what is the philosophy on zoos and gorillas? Okay, the really uh, complicated answer, and I'm gonna try to simplify it. There is a conservation agenda that all accredited zoos have. Um, there's also an underlying ethical and moral foundation for what we do. And so our foundation, first and foremost, is that anything that lives here, no matter what the, the intent is, how benevolent or how scientific, anything that lives here, we have to believe, and, and to some extent we have to prove, that it can essentially thrive. In the old days, it was at a zoo, if something can survive, and if something can reproduce, that was success but we all know that's not a measure of quality of life. So elephants was, a, was a, a really simple story. We knew they were not thriving. We knew they were suffering and we knew that that was happening elsewhere as well. And we knew that there was nothing we could do that would change that fundamentally. With gorillas, we don't see that. There certainly are challenges. There are challenges anytime you keep anything in captivity including domestic animals, although it's much more difficult with wild animals. But we basically understand the needs, the physical, social, psychological needs of most animals. We know where we can meet those, we know where we can't. And I will remind everybody that all of us, no matter what species we are, no matter which individual we are, we all are making compromises in life every single day. We have to compromise because of people around us, because of limited things around us. The issue is, can we cope with those compromises? Elephants couldn't, and we saw the results with their behavior and their physical condition. With gorillas, we don't see that. We don't see the, the inability of gorillas to cope, especially with a place like this, which has a very large, comparatively speaking, uh, facility. So we're constantly monitoring and looking for signs. Doesn't matter whether it's gorillas or anything else. Will the animals here thrive? If they don't, they need to be somewhere else. Other questions? If I heard you correctly, you said that the community asked, <clears throat> excuse me, asked you to come to them. It wasn't you that sought out um, them. If you could elaborate on that uh, process for Grace. Yeah, sure, great. Um, so basically in 2008 is when the um, ICCN, which is the Congolese Wildlife Authority, um, had already started confiscating the orphaned gorillas. So they had, how many at the time, 2008? seven orphans that they didn't know what to do with. So they had these orphan gorillas and they want to keep confiscating them because that helps them enforce the law by doing so. 
but they had no solution for these gorillas. And so what they did is they approached the Diane Fossey Gorilla Fund International and said, can you help us? So the Fossey Fund is a, um, an NGO that they, they mainly work with, with mountain gorillas um, and they do research and conservation. So they approached the Fossey Fund and said, can you please help us figure out what to do with these, these orphan gorillas? So the Fossey Fund founded GRACE and then brought on um, a slew of partners, including um, the Detroit Zoo, to help build the facility, um, figure out ways to manage these gorillas. And now Grace is working with um, many conservation partners um, for the conservation action plan for Grower's Gorillas in Eastern DRC in order to figure out, is there um, a solution that involves uh, reintroduction for these, these individuals? So that's something that is still ongoing. Um, we're still doing the surveys to figure out where gorillas live and where the habitat um, remains. And then once we had that information, we would be able to answer that question more. But yeah, so they invited, they invited Fossey Fund to come and help, and then this is a continuation of those efforts. In Rwanda and Uganda, they have tourists that come and visit the gorillas. And I know it's limited, I know they have a very limited time in the parks. Is that helpful or hurtful because in what you're saying is that um, you know you don't have a tourist uh, industry there. Sometimes tourists are the best people to come back and be the educators. But is that uh, something different that it's okay for the human beings to be? I guess you go. I haven't done it, but you can actually go and uh, sit with the gorillas. And is that helpful to them, or is that ruining their um, their? adaption to their own life? Well, um, like you mentioned, tourists are sometimes very important wildlife conservation advocates. And um, it has been studied and responsible ecotourism is actually one of the better ways to protect these remaining populations of mountain gorillas. And actually the mountain gorillas, due to all the um, efforts of conservation, which is f largely funded by tourism, the population is increasing and it's amazing. Um, so as long as we don't get greedy, or the, the park authorities don't get greedy and invite too many tourists and go too close. And if we respect the gorillas and we respect that we are visitors in their habitat, we keep a distance, we um, don't disturb them, I think it is a very um, good way and it's a long-term solution for um, conservation because a government is motivated by the income that tourists bring. You and is that something that should be done? Is that something that on a very small scale should be done at Grace to bring more people aware? Well, we could never do the kind of gorilla tourism because um, our gorillas are orphan gorillas. They're hand raised by humans. Um, they are uh, getting ready to go back into the wild. So we are trying to desensitize them. Um, but um, observing wild gorillas or observing them from view viewing platforms when they're in their forest, that would be a way for tourists to get more involved and um, that would be a possibility, absolutely. Uh, I just want to mention, this just came out, uh, you know, obviously there's a, an incredible battle going on about ivory and the continued slaughter of elephants for ivory uh, for China and other markets. By the way, there still is, uh, we are, I think, number three uh, which is shocking. Um, however, uh, somebody just did some really good economic analysis and has proven that the financial benefit of ecotourism with living elephants far surpasses the economic uh, incentive for the few people who are trying to kill the elephants for, for ivory. So, um, there are other issues, which is there is no real tourism infrastructure, and the DRC is, you know, a very challenging place, but that paradigm does work. Let's just do one more. Um, 
and then um, we'll wrap it up. Can can you, uh, Jenny? The 24 acres that you are now going to be moving or adding on, I guess, will they be, will the gorillas be able to forage for themselves or will you continue to feed them? Yeah, we're actually in the middle now of developing um, how our management plan is going to change. So uh, we're going to be there in two weeks and working with our care staff on that. So initially, we will be continuing to provision them with this 600 pounds of vegetation. Can you imagine cutting 600 pounds of vegetation every single day? This is what our staff do. They haul it on their heads in from the forest. Um, it's a very major undertaking, but we're absolutely committed to it because it's the best thing to do for the gorillas in terms of their health. For example, they don't have any digestive issues, which a lot of gorillas do have, uh, captive gorillas do have. So um, we feed a, nine, a 90, 95 percent natural diet to the gorillas. Um, and as they get um, into the forest enclosure, over time, ideally, they will start foraging on their own. One thing that we're doing is we're having our, our first ever, very proud of this, first ever graduate student starting in November. So she's going to be coming out and doing behavioral observations to watch to see how the gorillas adjust to this forest enclosure. So she's going to be watching very carefully, tracking the progress of each individual and of the group as a whole, um, as well as she's going to be able to monitor um, uh, non-invasively stress hormones using shed hair to look at the stress levels of the, of the gorillas to make sure that everything um, is happening as, as we hope it will. Um, but then over time, the provisioning will go down and my dream is that one day they decide to make their nests out there and they stay out there all night. And then from there, we move on to start thinking about reintroduction. Well, thank you very much, Sonia and Lautzen, and thank you all for coming here to support them.